to supply for thank the Lord for the opportunity to come to your house this evening. And I pray Lord, that as we worship you tonight, that our worship could be from our hearts and bring honor and glory to you. When we leave this place, we say it's been good to be in your house this evening. Pray for all those who have asked him in our prayers, both here and from other places, that you would be with them. We're thankful that Sarah can know you as her Savior. I pray for others that don't know you. I pray, Lord, that they can also trust Christ as their Savior to be born again and have eternal life. I pray, Lord, that you would be with that as a pastor here. I pray that you would give him physical and uh, emotional and strength of voice and everything he needs while he preaches and teaches your word. I pray, Lord, that you would be with all of our missionaries. I pray for Eddie and Ethan who left to be with us today. I pray for those who give enough love to comfort them. Have mercy on our nation. Have your will away in the election. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus who loved us and died for us and rose again and gave us eternal life. I pray, Lord, that you would give us a good week. Help us to be a blessing and help us to be humble and close to you in Christ's name. Page 197. Page 197.
285.
tonight I'm going to read in two different places in the scriptures. First of all, in the book of Proverbs, and then in the book of Psalms. Proverbs chapter 2 and Psalm 119. Proverbs 2, and we'll read the first nine verses in Proverbs 2. Now, first of all, the words of the son, Solomon, and then we'll turn and read the words of his father, David, in the book of Psalms. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thy heart to understanding, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, he is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Thou, then thou shalt understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. Now in Psalm 119, and we'll begin our reading there, in verse 32 of Psalm 119. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant, who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach, which I fear for thy judgments are good. Behold, I long after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. I to ask a question to provoke some thought, both on your part and my part. Are we starving? Are we starving? Now, years ago, when my two boys were young, and uh, we'd take a trip going somewhere. That was the most often asked question as we were traveling. It began with, Dad, I'm starving. Where are we going to eat? And, uh, you know, they say that uh, we read about the bottom of this pit in the book of Revelation. And uh, the question has often been asked, uh, where's the bottom of this pit? And uh, the answer would be in a teenager's stomach. And uh, so <clears throat> children grow and they grow in a hurry. And uh, it takes a lot of food to keep them going, a lot of nourishment to keep them going, especially if they're real active. And uh, of course they need the nourishment to be able to grow. And uh, I'm thankful that uh, I'd rather uh, my child have an appetite and be able to do the things that uh, he or she would need to do uh, rather than uh, have no appetite and not be able to do anything. And to make spiritual application of this, <coughs> are we starving as people of God? Are we feasting upon the Word of God as we should? You know, <clears throat> food is necessary in order to sustain us in the natural man. 
And the Bible teaches us that we're to pray and ask for our daily bread. And God knows just exactly what we need today. And daily bread does not only include that that we take as nourishment for our physical bodies, but it also, as children of God, includes our spiritual diet. And uh, I think sometimes we run pretty lean on that spiritual side of it. And uh, there was a little nursery rhyme one time that said, <clears throat> um, Jack Spratt could eat no fat, his wife could eat no lean. And so between the both of them, you see, they lived the clatter clean. And so there's the physical side and there's the spiritual side. And if we partake of that physical part of it, well, then we can know that uh, we're going to have the proper nourishment, physically speaking. And, you know, some people uh, just don't eat enough look like to uh, keep themselves alive. And then sometimes we kind of overdo it. And uh, there has to be a happy medium somewhere. But spiritually speaking, we need to desire that wonderful word of life, that bread of life that's given to us in the word of God. Now, <clears throat> in our text today, in Psalm 119, the psalmist expresses eight ways to satisfy the spiritual appetite. Now, it'd be very difficult to sit down and eat an eight-course meal, would it not? I don't, there may have been a time that I could have done that. I couldn't do it now. And the older I get, the less my appetite is. And uh, I may not look like it, but uh, nevertheless, I, I just can't eat what I used to eat. But God's Word is ever pleasing will satisfy the longing of the soul. Now, as I said, he mentions eight ways in this text that um, we can satisfy that spiritual appetite. And the first way uh, is given to us in verse 33. He said, teach me, O Lord. So we have need to be taught as the people of God. And we never grow too old to learn Word of God. It's often been said that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, there are some things that, uh, you know, that uh, we can learn. And I I've heard people say, you know, I don't want a computer in my home because it'd be too difficult at my age to learn how to use it. And uh, then I see people out in public that are bound to be older than I am. Uh, and they're just really uh, texting and uh, using uh, that phone uh, and uh, they're doing a good job of it. And so when it comes to the things of God, we're never too old to learn about things of God. We don't get to the point to say, well, I've learned it all. And there's nothing left for me to learn. This is a lifetime study. And we are to read his word every day if we're to receive that proper nourishment. Now, we Baptists don't like to hear the term fasting. And the reason we don't like to hear that term is that we enjoy eating. And I remember one time, uh, Brother Burns was talking to me one day, it's been years ago, when y'all were down at Bethel. And he said, Y'all had a time when uh, the church got concerned about uh, all souls being saved and uh, people were encouraged to fast. I don't remember how many days it was. But he said uh, it was to end uh, that Sunday at noon. And, and he said when church broke up that day, he said it didn't take long for people to leave the church. He said everybody was going to McDonald's to scarf down the hamburgers. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, we enjoy eating uh, that physical food. But how many times do we really enjoy that spiritual food that he's given to us? So he said, teach me. 
In the 119th Psalm, in verse 12, he said, Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Teach me your ways. Teach me your law. Teach me your word. That's what I desire. That's what I need as a child of God. And then the second way is to give me. In verse 34, give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Understand the proper understanding. Now, I had a church member years ago uh, to make this statement to me one day. Uh, she said, you know, Brother Long, there, there are three ways that uh, we can do things. And I said, well, how's that? She said, uh, we can do it your way, we can do it my way, and we can do it the Lord's way. So we have an opportunity to choose which way uh, we're going to do it. And she was, she was so accurate in, in her perception of that, uh, that we have uh, three ways that we can choose from. But if we'll look to Him for understanding, we'll get the right meaning from it. And it'll be a blessing to us. And, and we can't get it any other way than for Him uh, to give it to us. So we're to ask God for a deeper understanding of His Word. And there are some things, uh, as uh, we're told in Scripture, there are some things that are hard uh, to be understood. And there are some things maybe that we'll never know in this life, but one day we'll have that full revelation. One day He'll reveal it all to us on the other side. But until then, uh, we need uh, to be searching for the answers that we have the questions for. Uh, we need to be searching for God's will and way in our lives uh, and for His guidance in our lives. Then, <clears throat> the third way is in verse 35. Make me to go. Now, He will lead. He will guide and direct our path as a child of God. Now, we may think we know the right way. It's often been said that the road to hell has, is being paved with good intentions. And we may have the best intentions in the world and, and really be sincere about it. But it, sometimes it may be the case that we've not sought God. If it's not God's will, and you find this evident in the life of the apostles, especially in the life of the apostle Paul, he had a desire to go certain places that the Lord hindered him or would not allow him to go. And he thought that if he went out of those places, that he could be a great blessing to those people. And, and no doubt uh, that uh, in his mind, in his heart, he felt that he could. And, and I believe he was just as sincere uh, about it as he could be. But then the Lord hindered or would not allow him to go to some of those places. And so, when the Lord directs our path, we don't have to worry about whether we're headed in the right direction. We don't have to worry about uh, whether or not that, that we're doing uh, the right thing about it. And we don't have to worry about whether it's going to turn out or not. If God is in it, God is going to bless. Sometimes we can't see that. But that's the case. In Ezekiel chapter 36, I want to turn to read two or three verses of Scripture. And I want us to listen to what Ezekiel says here in uh, verses 26 and 27. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. He changes the heart. He breaks up that stony heart of man. He gives man a fleshly heart. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. Now, I want you to get the order of this. First of all comes the conversion of the soul. The birth 
and of the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he'll be able by his spirit to cause us to walk in his statues and we'll be able to keep his judgments and do them as he said in verse 27. So we have to wait upon God and let him do the guiding. Let him lead us by his spirit. Then in verse 36, he speaks about inclining. He said, incline my heart unto thy testimonies. Now, the word incline means to be drawn toward something. And so he says that he will draw us unto that that he would have us to do. Draw us unto him. That he will draw us unto his testimonies, unto his word. And not to be covetous. And so, are we inclining on him? I'm afraid that we're doing more reclining than inclining. And when I say that, most of us have a recliner at the house that we like to kind of kick back and relax in. And kind of like the song that said, a man that was praying, he said he thought the Lord said, uh, fishing reels, and the Lord was saying mission fields. And uh, so sometimes we, we kind of, as Glenn used to say when he was a little boy and he'd do things he wasn't supposed to do, he'd say, I accidentally on purpose did that. And I think sometimes accidentally on purpose <laughs> we do that, that we really don't incline unto him as we should. In verse 37, he talks about turning us. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, vain things. Solomon talked about that he came to the conclusion that all was vanity and vexation. Being vain is one of the worst things that we can do as a human being. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We need to be drawn toward Him in every way. Turn us away from the things that would lead us astray. Should be our prayer. And turn us on to truth and righteousness as His people. In the book of Isaiah in chapter 33, and I know I'm turning to a lot of different places tonight, but I trust that this will help us better uh, get the message the Lord has for us tonight in uh, chapter 33 and uh, verse uh, 15. We read, He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shut his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. So we're given this confidence. We're given this assurance that if we will uh, turn to him and uh, abide uh, in the things that he'd have us to do, that he'll bless us in every conceivable way. Then in verse 38, he speaks about being established in his word. Establish thy word unto thy servant. Become rooted and grounded in his word. Is what it means. And to confirm his word. And to make it firm and true in our lives. And we need, as, as the old adage goes, we need to practice what we preach. You know, we can tell others, well, you need to do this, or you need to do that, but are we doing it ourselves? Sometimes we're guilty of sweeping around our neighbor's back door before we clean up around ours. Amen? And, and when we do that, we've not taken proper 
view of what we should be doing as children of God. So he will establish us in the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 13, and let's look at verse 9. Be not carried about with divers, that means in diverse kinds, and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. The first <clears throat> statement in that verse is what I want us to see. Be not cared about by divers and strange doctrines. And the reason that we're not to be cared about with strange doctrines is that so we can be established with grace and not with means. And many people today are not rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Just because a person is faithful to come to church and support uh, the different uh, phases of uh, the church's mission to the world doesn't mean that they're automatically established in the faith or that they're rooted and grounded in the Word of God. I remember one time one of our ministers who went to be the Lord several years ago and was a uh, very influential uh, minister in this local area. He was moderator of our uh, local association for many, many years, but W.H. Driscoll, and a dear friend of mine, he <clears throat> made a statement one time at Macedonia Church there. He made an incorrect statement on purpose. He told me later on about it. He said, the reason I did that is because there's some of them in there, everything I said, they were hollering amen. And not that he didn't want to hear some amens, but he said something intentionally way out in left field, and somebody hollered amen, so he just stopped. And he said, you know that's not right. And he admonished him. And so we need to think about it. what we believe and why we believe. We need to be established in the Word of God. In verse 39, he speaks about turn away my reproach which I hear, fear, for thy judgments are good. Now, what he's saying here is keep me from doing things that would bring shame and reproach on the cause of Christ. I thought about what uh, Brother Dostey said in his message this morning about the things that he experienced as uh, just a young boy in the church where he grew up. And how it probably, he didn't go into a lot of detail about it, but the, those of us who are here today, we heard what he said. Uh, and and that, that was a lot for our a young boy to have to witness. And no doubt that it did not help him to be saved to see all that going on. And so we're to pray that he keep us from doing those things that would bring shame and reproach on the cause of Christ. And I think sometimes ministers are held up to the point that they can do no wrong. That's not true. All you have to do is turn to the Word of God and you can find instances where men of God did that that was wrong and hurtful to the cause of Christ. The Apostle Peter denied the Lord. He cursed and he swore so you mean a preacher to do that? You know, when I was a little boy, I, I was with a crowd that thought a preacher could do no wrong. And when I got to the place that I found out that some of them did do wrong, it hurt me in my heart. But I'm thankful that the Lord helped me work th through that 
and see that I needed the Lord regardless of what the preacher did, that the preacher was not going to save my soul. He took the blood of Jesus Christ to save my soul. Preachers are human beings. They're sinners saved by the mercy and grace of God. And Satan loves to take someone who is high profile, such as a minister or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher, song leader, a musician, whatever, uh, their position in the church, to have influence over the people and get them to do wrong, encourage them to do wrong. Because this plates is seeds of doubt in the hearts of those who are lost. And many is the person who said, I feel better than they do and they're a church member and I'm not. That's very hurtful. Down through the years of my ministry, I've heard that so many times. It's like a broken record. Some people don't know what a record is now, but anyway, it was around this that they used to put music on. And uh, if it got broken, sometimes it'd hang up in one place. They'd play the same thing over and over again. And so we can't overly emphasize the fact of the fact that the Lord, we need to pray the Lord to spare us from doing those things that would be hurtful to the cause of Christ. In the 39th division of the Psalm, Psalm 39, verse 8. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. Verse 40. He can quicken or revive us. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts, and is after thy word. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Quicken me. Make me alive. Make me an instrument of honor, a vessel of honor in your cause. And certainly that uh, God can do that in our lives. Now, are we starving as God's people? Starving for the words of righteousness? They're all right here. All we have to do is take the time to dig it out. All we have to do is, is pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal unto us those things that we don't understand in his word. God's word is a living word. It's not a dead word. God's word shall stand forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But his word is going to be around in the long term in eternity. And you realize that when men stand in the final judgment, the wife's on the judgment, that the books will be opened and another book will be opened, which is the book of life. And the books, one of the books that's going to be opened are the books of the Bible. So God's word is not just a pretty book to be placed up in the bookshelf to collect dust. It's not something that you want to have on the coffee table in case a preacher drops by and he knows not, that you have God's Word in your home. It is our guidebook for our preparation for heaven. And every day, as children of God, we need to be getting prepared our heavenly journey. You don't know who among us may be the, first, uh, the, uh, the next one to go to be the Lord. You know, I got to church this morning, heard the news about uh, this dentist that uh, passed away. I'm sure that left a lot of people in shock. 
because no one was expecting that. And it may be that when our time comes, the Lord calls us home, that it could be sudden and unexpected. Some people have to go through a long period of uh, decline in their health before they pass away. Some people are killed accidentally, such as an automobile accidents, drownings. I'm sure you probably read about a 75-year-old man trying to save his grandson from drowning in Dawson Island the other day, and he drowned trying to save the boy grandson and uh, but you know we were like that little boy we were about to drown as a sinner in the depths of sin the Lord reached out to us and the Lord didn't just about drown <laughs> when he reached out to us but he reached out to us and he saved us from our sin and gave us eternal life. So are we about to start? We take the word of God and defend the faith that was once delivered unto us. Can we defend what we believe? Someone came to you, child of God, and said, can you explain why you believe what you believe? Could you do it? Could you take the word of God? Show them why you believe what you believe. Someone came to you and said, I'm lost and I need help. Could you show them from the word of God what it takes to be saved? And I'm not depending upon the word of some man when it comes to salvation. I'm depending upon thus saith the word of God. I'm going to uh, stand on God's word rather than upon the word of man. Man can be wrong. God be true. In closing tonight, I know that um, as God's word, as I said earlier, the message tonight is a lifetime study. And we should never become weary. I think you say, well, Scripture teaches as much study as weariness of the flesh. It's not speaking about studying the word of God. Philosophers have studied. Men of great learning have studied. Thank God, His Word changes not. Some men have tried to change it, but it changes not. Do you know Christ is your Savior? If you don't, you are spiritually starved. You need to eat of the bread of life and drink water of life. And Jesus is both. You know, I thought about this morning the men's prayer practice both David English makes homemade bread and brings it to the men's prayer breakfast every time. And as I sat back there this morning, I saw the <coughs> bread that he made. I thought about, you know, he went to a lot of trouble and effort make that bread. It didn't take just a few minutes to make it. It, it took a while to make it. And those of you who remember Grandma Dixon, she used to make homemade bread. And, uh, you know, it took her a while to make it. And uh, those of you who cook and, and bake goods and so on, you know that uh, it, it takes a little while. Even if you go to the store and it comes out of a box, it takes a little while to stir it up and Put it, put it in the oven, let it bake, and so on. But <clears throat> that bread that's on that table back there this morning, either someone ate it, is going to eat it today or in the next few days, or it'll perish. 
You leave bread out long enough, it's going to get hard, and it's probably going to become moldy, unfit for human consumption. But the bread of life, Jesus Christ, he's alive forevermore. He'll save you tonight if you'll trust him. If we're going to ask for a verse of an invitation to him, we sing this song, you think we have in your heart, you come, we stand and sing.